Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, as always, on behalf of Alice and myself and Brother Mark here, we want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are blessed that we can gather in his, in his word and in his presence, because he is in our midst. Amen. The, yes. He is the word made flesh that dwelt among us, and now we have this word. Praise God for his word. Amen. Amen. So we're going to pick up where we left off last week in the beginning of in chapter 6, the sixth chapter of 1 Timothy. Mm -hmm. um, last week we ended on the first two verses, 1 Timothy 6, 1 and 2. So we'll start today at verse 3. And we will do that right after Mark asks for God's blessing on our time together. Lord, we just thank you for your word. It's lo it's loving ki kindness and mercy. Just show us your love through your word. Amen. 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 Okay. Second. I, I want to keep saying second. It's First Timothy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> First we'll Timothy. Second Timothy. Shortly. It will be soon. First Timothy six. I'm going to read verses 3, 4, and 5 to start us off, all right? Okay. And just so you know, I'm reading from the New American Standard, and basically we use the New American Standard in the King James Version of the Bible. Might toss in some others as we go along, but they will all be the, the literal type, okay? If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with doctrine conforming to godliness... He is conceited and understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Right? A different doctrine and does not agree with sound words. You know, you have to remember when we started this Bible study in the first chapter of, of this letter, Paul had started that letter with uh, instruction to Timothy. He says, as I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange, strange doctrines. Mm -hmm. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.3, right? So there were some strange doctrines going on. There's always strange doctrines going on. The sound words are the words that have been passed on to us by men, and this is a quote, men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. That's what Peter said in Second Peter 1.21. And as Paul would write to Timothy in his next letter, he says, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Second Timothy 3.16. That's what is not strange doctrine. Those are sound words. Okay? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can wind up with, and this is what he says, a, a morbid interest in controversial questions. Right. Controversy arises when a matter is in doubt, open to interpretation, or a mystery that someone thinks they've solved. Mm -hmm. God's word is certainly not in doubt. When does the rapture take place? Before the, before the rapture? Know. I mean, when yeah. does the rapture take? Is it, is it pre-tribulation? Is it in the middle of the tribulation? Or is, is it the end of the tribulation? For, for, for that to be a question means there's not enough information in the Word. If there's not enough information in the Word, it's not important. And if we knew when it was going to happen, we wouldn't live by faith. Well, the, the fact is, because, you know, let me read something from, Paul's, from Peter's second letter. He said, seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these, right, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Mm -hmm. Second Peter 1, 3 to 4, right? And you get this in other words, the word of God. God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. If we don't know whether it's pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, it's because God doesn't want us to know. Right. 
And why? So if God doesn't, if, if God, if it doesn't pertain to life and godliness, why is there such great dispute about it? You don't have to answer that question. I mean, that's, well, that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> well, we were talking about this one day, and um, Jesus said, "Even I don't know when it is. The Father has that reserved for Himself. If Jesus in the flesh doesn't know, then the Bible, the the Word of God, it's not in the Word of God." No, sorry, no, I, I'm not and talking, but I don't want to get, I'm not trying to pick on one particular topic. Right. Yeah. Okay, I, you know, I use that as an example, the, the, the tribulation or the rapture. I use that as an example, but that's a good example because God has not given us full, if we, if he, if he wrote it out clear, we'd know, mm -hmm. right? The you know, scripture would show us. What and God's word is settled in heaven. Yes. All right, that's a, that's a fact. So, we know, I'm, I'm not saying we know everything, so there are things that God, but he has revealed everything. Mm -hmm. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, God has given us revelation. We need to grow in understanding, we need to seek understanding, but we need to be careful about getting into these questions that don't really, they don't matter. What difference does it make? How is it going to affect my life? The simple fact of the matter is, if I am a born-again blood saved child of God when the rapture takes place if I'm here I'm going right doesn't matter when and I don't care when it is mm -hmm. because God's sense of timing is the right sense of timing That's right. you know it's like if you're a little child your father doesn't have to explain everything about the household to you does he no no so but if you, the, the, what he what he's saying here is that when you get into different doctrines, when you get into this, when you get into you, get in, you wind up in controversial yeah. questions. Mm -hmm. And then you have strife. And, and then disputes. you have strife and disputes. Right. Friction. We have, we have to be careful about right. that. Right. Uh, you know, I, I see so much of that. I actually see an awful lot of that in the body of Christ. It's like people squabbling about things. And what difference does it make? Right. And then there's division. And there is indeed division. Mm -hmm. And it says in, in, in the word, the goal of our instruction is love. love. If that's our goal, uh, what are we doing bringing up stuff that doesn't matter much? It's, well, because it it's matters side stuff. <laughs> a, a lot of things matter to people who are not being led by the Spirit of God, guided by the Spirit of God. Because you get into things. I'm, I'm telling you that the Spirit of God was sent to lead us to all, into all truth. Mm -hmm. If he hasn't led us into that truth, we don't we don't need it. You don't need you don't need to be a theologian. You don't need to know all of you. You need there are mysteries in the Word of God. All right, there are things, but they will be revealed. We will have understanding in the proper time. Look at Daniel. Daniel was a man faithful to God, used by God, but when he sought to know about the end times, it, it just you know God sent word to him. It's not for you to know now. Right. It'll be revealed in the end. Mm -hmm. So there's still more to come. But we as brothers and sisters need to be careful about squabbling over things that have not been clearly revealed in the exactly. Word of God. Yes. Because that will lead to contention. It will lead to strife. It will lead to division. Mm -hmm. Okay. And these are people, he says, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Right. Their focus is on what are they going to what are they going to get? What are they going to get? What are they getting? You know, I I think I shared this Sunday. As a matter of fact, I had an an uncle, an aunt and uncle who were like a second mother and father to me. I mean, we were, we were that close. And when I got saved, um, they were religious, you know, but culturally and didn't have a right relationship, relationship. with the Lord. Right. And. <clears throat> They were shocked that I got saved, and all of a sudden, my entire focus, the entire focus of my life, shifted. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, my the focus of my life had been money. Mm -hmm. And now, all of a sudden, my focus changed entirely to the Lord God Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. And when I shared with my uncle, his name was Bob. When I shared with my uncle Bob that I was going to go into full time ministry, his first reaction was, "Well, there's money in that." Well, that's a horrible reaction, other than the fact I found out after having some conversation with him that that came from him watching, and this is back in the mid-70s, right? That came from him watching 
some preachers on television, and what he perceived, what he saw, was their their wealth, their their worldly success. And he assumed that if I went into it, that's what I would happen with me, right? So that's the bad thing, that this is the impression that's, that so much of the church is giving people, that it's about it's about money. Their focus is on gain. Their focus is on wealth. The, the good part about that was he was watching and listening to the word. Seeds so were being planted. So even though he may have been hearing or watching people that were inaccurately living the word of God, the point was he was hearing the word of God. So it was kind of a you know two-sided coin. The question becomes, what do you consider gain? It's not monetary. Yeah. If it, Stuff. Well, if it, well, he says, you know, there are people who think, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Mm -hmm. What do you think gain is? You know, it, if it's anything, yes, anything that the world has to offer, then you have not imitated Jesus or the apostle Paul who said that we should imitate him as he imitated Christ, right? Because he said, and this is from Philippians 3, I'm going to read verses 7 and 8. Whatever things were gained to me, right? now listen to this, this is Paul saying, whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. He counted all things lost. You know, so much of the, the church today is filling up these big buildings by promising people gain. You know, come to us. How many of them are out there preaching? Well, you know, come to me and then you're, you're going to, we're going to, God, Jesus is going to ask you to count it all lost. Is he not? Yes. You have to die to yourself. You have to, you have to count yourself as lost. You have to die to yourself. You have to deny yourself. You have to pick up your cross and follow him daily, right? So dissatisfaction and worldly desire, not love, make the world go around. You know that song, Love Makes the World? No, it doesn't. <laughs> what makes the world go around, and I'm talking about the world system, is dissatisfaction. It's worldly desire. Not having enough money, not having enough power, not having enough recognition, self-esteem. I can't get no satisfaction, the Rolling Stones sang. That's 1965, they're still singing it, poor boys. Yes. That's what drives, that's what drives the ambition, <clears throat> is not having enough, okay, not satisfied. It says in Proverbs, it says in Proverbs, the leech has two daughters, give, give. There are three things that will not be satisfied, four that will not say enough. Proverbs 30, 15. And then, you know, years ago, many, many years ago, I had the opportunity. We had a, a church group and somebody had come to visit one of the people in the church. It was um, one of the fellow's mother. And she came from kind of an old, prosperous New England family. And I had the opportunity. I wound up actually sitting with her at the kitchen table for hours and hours that evening after our Bible study, and I'm talking about late, late in, mm -hmm. I was going to say late into the night, actually early into the early morning hours. And I was sharing the gospel with her, and I was sharing about Jesus Christ, and kind of getting to the conclusion of this, she made it clear. She said, you know, I'm, I just, I can't see doing this, because it is about, she recognized that, that God would ask her to give. And she was very wealthy, right? So I said, listen, I said, you've been listening to me all night. I said, you need to hear from God. Mm -hmm. I said, why don't you just take my Bible, just randomly flip it open. I'm going to trust <clears throat> that God will to speak to you because you've been listening to me and nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. I said, you need to hear from God. And she, so she said, okay. So she took my Bible and she flipped it open and she flipped open and she read this verse. He who loves silver, money, will not be satisfied with money, with silver. Nor he who loves abundance with its income, this too is vanity. If you love money, it's never going to satisfy you. And where is that? Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 5.10. 
Now, if that wasn't God speaking to her that night, I don't know. Well, of course, she was just visiting, so I, I honestly don't know, you know, how that how that seed that God spoke to her, if it's born fruit or not, I don't know. But I'll tell you what, God spoke to her very clear. I mean, imagine that was what she was talking about. And she flipped open the Bible randomly, and that's exactly the word that God speaks to her. If you love your money, you're not going to be satisfied with your money. Let a man examine himself. I mean, what do you desire? More of Jesus. Well, think about the words of Paul to the church of the Galatians, all right? Galatians 5.17, he said, for the flesh, that's the natural man, the flesh sets its desire against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Your flesh and your spirit are at war. And let me tell you this, it's a battle to the death. Mm -hmm. Either you are going to die to yourself or you're, I mean, it's a battle only, to the there's death. There's only going to be one victor. There, there can only be one, absolutely right, there's only one victor. And you need to stand fast and decide and then live about that decision. You know, as a matter of fact, I posted something on Twitter just uh, this past week. I said that if, if you compromise, mm -hmm. if, a, if a saint of God, if a born-again Bible-believing Christian compromises, he has traded his white robes of righteousness for a white flag of defeat, a surrender. Mm -hmm. You can't compromise. Mm -hmm. No man can serve two masters, Jesus Christ said. Joshua said out in the wilderness, you got to choose this day who you will serve. Yes. You can't, you, there's no fence to sit on. There is no gray area. Jesus said, you are either for me or you're against me. Let's get real. So consider what the psalmist said in Psalm 73, 25. Mm. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. I pray to God that I can get to that place where that is the cry of my heart. I don't desire anything. I, the only thing I want to desire is him. Amen. I desire nothing on earth. Well, what God spoke to Job, Job, he said, if you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you remove unrighteousness far from your tent and place your gold in the dust and the gold of Ophir among the stones of the brooks, then the Almighty will be your gold mm. and choice silver to you. For then you will delight in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. Job 22, 23 to 26. You choose the things of the world or you choose the things of God. What do you desire? And if you've been convinced that you can have both, let me just tell you something. You can only, you can only desire one. God may give you things, but you only better have a desire for one, right? Think about the heart of Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, Thy words were found, and I ate them. Your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I have been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah 15, 16. What, what delights you? What do you desire? What are the things you really want? I mean, that you, you, you said it. I've said I, the best prayer that I'm, well, the best prayer I know at this moment in time, this second for this, is very simple. More. I want more, but I want more of you, Lord. More of you, Lord. It's like that song, Lord, you are more precious than silver. Absolutely. More costly than gold. There's I, nothing I desire. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So that has to become, and if that's not your heart, like I said, it says, let a man examine himself. Pray. Like David prayed, cleanse my heart, O oh Lord. Bring us, bring us to that place. Mm. And that'll happen when you fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of your faith. Because otherwise, you know what? You're going to be glancing around looking at the world and the things of the world. And they are bait yes. on the snares and traps that the devil has set to draw you away. I'm just telling you the truth. God wants you to have abundant life. He said that he came that you might have joy and that your joy may be made full. He came that you would have life and have it abundantly. But he also said, Luke 12, 15, it says, then he said to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. It's not about your stuff. I have had the opportunity through my life. I mean, I grew up in a very posh setting in, in New York City in Manhattan when I was a child. 
I've seen so many wealthy people. I mean, when I say wealthy people, I mean wealthy mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And I've seen so many people who were never happy because of what they had. Because, you know, they, they might have had money, they might have had possessions, but you know what they didn't have? They didn't have that peace that passes yeah. understanding. They didn't have that joy that only the, the, the Word of God can give you, that only God can give you, right? The fruit it, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In, in these last days, when we are warned about the peril, the danger that will abound, we're given the signs of the times which start with, for men will be lovers of self, and lovers of money. These are the dangers. These are things, the days. Okay? They are. While Jesus offered life filled with him, mm -hmm. Satan showed his plan when he offered Jesus in the wilderness all the kingdoms of the world and their glory at the expense of his soul. <laughs> right? So Jesus said later in Matthew, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? There are so many, many, many examples. Okay? Riches don't satisfy. Never. I mean, one of the great, great examples, there was nobody who had been given more wisdom by God. There was nobody who had been given more riches by God than Solomon, David's son. Mm -hmm. And yet if you go look in Lamentations, in the second, not in Lamentations, in Ecclesiastes, in the second chapter, you'll see that there is the, the the worst example of ministry burnout that ever happened. Mm. He said he hated the work of his hands. He despised the work of his hands. Mm. He and was he said, lamenting. He was absolutely, it was, yeah, it was his lamentation. Yeah. But he was saying, you know, it's like he hated the work of his hands. He hated everything. He said, and he says, he cries out and says, you know, why have I been given this wisdom? He forgot why God had blessed him. Yes. But if you look at the first part of that chapter, the second chapter of Ecclesiastes, you'll see. He had. He was building homes for himself. He was building vineyards for himself. He was. It, everything was a focus on him. He was gaining in riches. Why did he need to gain in riches? God had blessed him with abundance like nobody else, and yet he's still struggling to get more, right. more, more, more. He was building his own kingdom, and you know the more, more, more. You know what it did? It lost him, lost him, lost him. All right. Let's get on to another verse. So we're yeah. zipping. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. Abraham, our father according to the flesh, found both great gain and contentment. All right? It's not that you can't have both. Right. It's what you desire and what you seek after. All right? What's the focus? Because God can, can bless you immensely in the world. Right, right. All right? Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and satisfied with life. He was gathered to his people. Genesis 25, 8. He was satisfied. He was content. I don't know how many people you know that are satisfied, that are content with that, with their, whatever their situation is, with their job, with their home, with anything. And the, the fact is, not very many. Most people are not satisfied. They're just they're discontent. So while the people in the world struggle to be content and find satisfaction, we are promised by the one who cannot lie mm -hmm. and never broke a promise. Amen. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Matthew 5, 6, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, that's God's promise. You will find satisfaction. You will find contentment. And he went on in that Sermon on the Mount to also proclaim do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, but for your fa heavenly father knows that you need these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Matthew 6, 31 and 33. He's going to take care of you. And that, gives you, that has to give you a peace that passes understanding. Which is why he said, you know, Paul wrote in Philippians, think about these words. Make them part of your life. Mm -hmm. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Right? Philippians 4, 6, and 7. You have the richest father. Mm. Okay? 
there, there was a movie we just saw, Mark was telling us about it, and we saw it, All the Money in the World, about J. Paul Getty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What a miserable life. What a miserable life. Mm. You have a father who has all the money in the world, right. has all everything at all. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. All of it belongs to God. And he is so generous that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, just for you, to meet your need. Check Romans 8.32 and look around here. So he goes on in the next verse, in verse 7, to say, If we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. Unlike Egypt, where God brought the people out of, all right, okay. the religious but not godly world, they believe that you can indeed take it with you. What do you think all of the tombs are? Mm -hmm. are? I mean, everything was about, Mines, yeah. yeah, you can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. You can send it ahead. Mm -hmm. Store up your treasures in heaven. Thank you so much. Okay, do not store up your treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Yeah. You can send it on ahead. And, you know, it's not, it's not a matter of how much you have in your pocket. Maybe you, have, maybe you don't have anything in your pocket at the moment, but you got a lot of money in your bank. It's not about what you have at the moment here. It's about what's available to you. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. I mean, if I don't... Uh, listen, I, we don't say that we have... A, we don't have a lot in this world. My father's got everything. Mm -hmm. And he's promised to meet every need that I might have. And he does. Okay? That's why it says in, in verse 8, it says, If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. Food and covering. Mm -hmm. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote, and so again, to the Philippians, and he said... Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Christ, through him who strengthens me. Philippians 4, 11 to 13. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a, yeah, it's a secret. It's a mystery. But you can learn, and you have to learn to be content. Yes. Where do you learn? From the Word of God. Amen. From the voice of the Holy Ghost. From the teaching of Jesus Christ and those he inspired. Mm -hmm. We have to learn to be content. Because everything in the world is trying to make you discontent. It's the truth. Yes, it is. We are living in a world that is filled with absolute propaganda attempting to draw you away and draw you away into discontentment by making promises to you that it cannot keep. But God cannot lie. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that the word that you have spoken is settled in heaven. The word you have spoken to us is truth. The word that you have spoken to us is life. And Lord, that you love us so much, Father, that you gave Jesus Christ. Help us to learn what that means. Help us to learn that there is no good thing that you would withhold from us. Lord, that you will meet every need that we have. That you will give us joy unspeakable. That you give us peace that passes understanding. Lord, help us to live in that abundance, in that joy. We just praise you and thank you for your son Christ Jesus and the word that he brought Praise God. Well, time goes so fast. Till next week, be back with us again. And we're going to look more at this, this whole issue of being content. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not content with your life, with your situation, with anything in your life, I promise you, he has an answer for it. So until next week, God bless you and goodbye. Thank you.